Welcome back, everyone, to the 19th Emerging Growth Conference. We're happy to continue on with these great companies coming up. Let's begin. We have Global Arena Holding, Inc. It trades on the OTC pink sheets under the symbol GAHC and is a holding and technology development company providing comprehensive technology-enabled election services. Today, we have with us its CEO, John Matthews. Welcome, John. Hi, thanks for having us back again. We really had a great time last time. Uh, we were a little bit more, uh, last time we were getting ready for a shareholders meeting. So this time we want to just give a little bit of an update, just discuss briefly where we are, and then open it up for some questions because we had a lot of shareholders that wanted to ask us some questions. So again, my name is uh, John Matthews, and I'm the chairman of uh, Global Arena Holding, Inc. Um, we've been a public company since uh, about 2011. Um, we trade our common stock, as they said, on the over-the-counter uh, pink sheet marketplace. And um, you can check out our stock through the, let's just see, HTP, www.otcmarkets.com, slash stock, slash GHC quote. We file all of our information, and we're current with our filings uh, with the Securities Exchange Commission. And you can find those filings at www.sec.gov. So uh, I want to thank everyone, uh, our current shareholders who are uh, on today, uh, our potential new investors uh, who may be thinking about joining our, uh, our, our company, and uh, listening to what we have to hear today. Um, as you know, when you do these events, uh, some of the statements that you might hear um, that are not historical fact are going to be information that would be of a forward-looking nature. So we just want you to take in consideration that some of the actual results, performance, or achievement of the company may be material different from uh, the results that we actually achieve. So accordingly, anyone that's actually watching this or looking at our information, um, we would want you to look at the SEC filings in the www.sec.gov, again, where we file all of our documents. So today I wanted to uh, just talk about, uh, you know, briefly, um, a couple of things that we think are very important that have just transpired in our company. Um, I wanted to talk about our recent shareholders meeting, update you on our business proposals um, that we had described in our 14A proxy material. And then today we're going to introduce you to the president of Global Election Services, uh, Catherine uh, Weisbeck. And uh, Catherine has been very instrumental in the growth of uh, Global Election Services. And she's going to give you a little insight into how we've been running that business and what we plan for the future. Um, with all the turmoil in elections today, um, we get a lot of calls from people who ask us about you know, what is going on with uh, U.S. elections. Um, and I've been reminded about a quote um, that was introduced to me by my former boss. Um, I worked for Senator Daniel Patrick Moynihan in his New York office for many, many years, uh, well, many years, many, many, many years ago. <laughs> um, and the quote that he introduced me to um, was from President John F. Kennedy, which was given at the Dublin Castle on June 28th in 1963. And it stuck with me for a long time. And President Kennedy at the time said, democracy is a difficult kind of government. Um, it requires the highest qualities of self-discipline, restraint, a willingness to make commitments and sacrifices for the general interest, and it also requires knowledge. And, and I think that in the state of affairs in America today, and this is not a political statement whether you're a Democrat or you're a Republican or you're an independent or you're a conservative, um, we see consistently year over the last year, um, many, many polls um, that show this great divisions in American politics. Um, most recently, one is the Yahoo News U.S. government poll of 1,500 thereabout adults conducted from July 30th to August 2nd, which found that 66 percent of all Republicans believe the election was stolen from Donald Trump, um, while only 18 percent believe that Joe Biden won fair and square. And 28 percent of independent voters also think that Donald Trump um, had the election stolen from him which you don't really get a lot in the media. And then, believe it or not, there are 3% of all Democrats that believe the election was also stolen. I think that John F. Kennedy, our former president, was talking about democracy being difficult. <laughs> this kind of takes it into play for a lot of us that, that I never thought would be uh, kind of experience this you know, in our lifetime. Um, we here at Global Elections not only believe it's our civic duty, but we're happy to have you know, be in the elections business at this period of time where we have experience. Um, we believe that elections need to be fair, accurate, certainly observable. I think that's really important and obviously uh, transparent. It's not a political position. Honestly, if Americans in this country believe the system is failing us as citizens today, as poll after poll continues to indicate, we feel certainly at GES that it's our responsibility to build and create an elections administration system that's beyond approach. We're doing elections every day. 
And I can tell you that when we do organized labor elections or corporate condo elections or elections that deal with the common people, what we hear over and over again is, can we observe it? Can we be sure that this is the actual result? What's going on when those machines actually read a ballot? And so these are the things that um, we want to focus on um, a little bit and just touch on today. Um, global Arena Holdings, for those of you that are new, and I know there are many new people that signed up today, we have uh, basically three operating subsidiaries. Two of them, um, well, we own three operating subsidiaries. Two of them are really not operating. We have GHI Acquisition, which was formed to acquire assets in the blockchain space, which you'll hear about more in the next quarter, and Tidewater Energy Group, which was originally formed to explore opportunities in the oil, gas, and energy business. Both of these are in development and are not actively producing any revenue for Global Arena Holdings at all. Global Election Services, on the other hand, produces 100% of the revenue that we do. Um, Global Election Services currently provides, for those of you that are new, comprehensive technology-enabled election services to organizations such as craft trade organizations, labor unions, political organizations, pension funds, credit unions, and even entertainment associations. I want to thank all of our shareholders who participated in our shareholders meeting. This is quite an undertaking for a company, even on the OTC market. Um, I want to thank uh, our attorney, Jody Walker, and our outside independent public auditor, Raul Craigra, for the help on the SEC 14A filings. A lot of people don't realize you have to file a document with the Securities Exchange Commission. I want to thank the outside um, firms, uh, Broadridge and Median, for reaching out to many of our street side shareholders. And I also want to thank Clear Trust LLC, who is a Global Arena Holdings transfer agent, who we hired as an outside third-party election administrator. Even though we're in the elections business, we chose to hire a third party so that there'd be no questions of um, any funny business. <laughs> um, I also want to thank all of our shareholders that participated in all of the resolutions. I'd like to note that 62.76% of our company stockholders participated in this year's annual uh, shareholders meeting. The proposals passed at this year's meeting were re-election of the members to the board of directors, the authorization of an increase to the company's authorized capital stock, the authorization of a reverse stock split, and the outstanding common shares, and the ratification of an appointment of the company's independent registered public accounting firm. I'll go a little slower over these proposals. Um, we were overwhelmingly happy of the support that we received to reappoint the current board of directors, myself, uh, Mr. Facundo Bacardi, and Mr. Martin Don, who have been with me since the very beginning, um, and to appoint Raul Corregra uh, as our outside independent auditor, uh, CPA, uh, for the calendar of the year. Uh, we also want to thank the shareholders for giving us the tools that we believe uh, are necessary to kind of grow the company uh, as we believe it needs to be grown uh, which over the next year, which could pretend all types of opportunities. Um, we kind of view these as tools. Um, so we want to thank them and you for giving us the authorization to increase the authorized, if necessary, to 4 billion shares and giving the board of directors the authorization to potentially affect the 1 for 12 reverse stock split should the board decide it's in uh, the best interest of the company, which would also include having the outside auditor and lawyers also agree with us. Um, for those of you shareholders that thought we would run right out the next day and file an application to do a one for 12, we have not done that. Um, I want to take a moment and kind of remind all of our shareholders that we had previously received authorization to increase shares and uh, previous uh, two years ago, and we also had received uh, authority to uh, 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 perform a one for four reverse, um, which we took no action on because we didn't see the appropriate deal that we thought was in the best interest of our shareholders. And so even though we have authorizations for these items, until the right deal presents itself, it's not something that we would uh, take lightly or just run off to do. Um, I would point out again that no management or no officer or director of Global Arena Holdings has ever sold stock in the nine years that we've been involved in the company. So we want to thank also uh, that you should know that the stockholders who have been with us showed strong support for both the authorized stock increase and reverse split stock, with over 70% of all voting uh, stockholders in support of each proposal, which we really appreciate. So having done that, I know many people are interested in what we put in the proxy, and where are you, John Matthews, and the Board of Global Elections and Global Arena Holdings? So I briefly want to describe the business deals that we're currently moving forward on. Um, as we previously described in the 14A shareholders proxy. Remember that all these proposals stated that all of these deals would begin to take place on or after we received approval and certainly after the closing of the shareholders meeting. So let's start with the most important one, um, the amended asset purchase agreement of election services solutions, LLC. Um, under this agreement, uh, 
global arena elections is purchasing 100% of the elections of elections asset solutions. Um, over the years, um, we've been working on this deal and we finally got it to, to where we believe it will close in, in this quarter. Um, GES is in the process of closing this deal right now. Um, none of these deals close overnight. There are lawyers, but these deals do move forward. There are corporate filings, and as we move forward with these deals, we'll announce press releases and file the appropriate AKs. Um, I just want to remind everyone that this business actually brought to us 80% of our existing client base, um, and it came from Election Services Solutions. We also were fortunate enough to uh, begin to work with Marilyn Fallick full-time, who's our CEO and has over 40 years of elections administration you know, in the business. Um, my father, the former CEO uh, of Election Services uh, systems is, is also uh, involved with us and his uh, advice and his experience um, as the former um, commissioner of elections for Nassau County, New York, uh, where he was the Board of Elections Commissioner, um, has been invaluable as we move forward with uh, the future progress of doing elections um, on a national scale where we'll have to see receive federal certification. Um, so we believe uh, that this is moving forward. We believe that this will close in this quarter. And we want to thank you for giving us, uh, you know, the authorization to move forward on these deals. Another deal that we thought was, uh, we, we think is the biggest deal, which we've discussed often, is our belief that there is a unique opportunity in conducting United States and foreign government elections. Um, I don't think you have to go much further than what we spoke about in the beginning of my opening remarks about America and where we stand as American citizens today to understand that there's a significant problem in this country and that people are going to be looking for companies that have better registration processes and better tabulation processes. And that's going to be an open market that's going to begin to develop very shortly. So to give you an idea of the breadth of that market for people that are new to this, um, we actually um, uh, by election software by county. Uh, the federal government sends standards, states set standards through their secretary of states, and then municipal governments in each county in America purchase those, uh, those software and machines. In the United States, there's 3,007 counties, 64 parishes, nine organized boroughs, and 11 census areas, 41 independent cities, and the District of Columbia, all of whom purchase election machines and software. This process uh, begins uh, first and foremost with uh, our software and our hardware being uh, tested um, by the Elections Assistance Commission. For those of you that um, are unfamiliar with the process, uh, the Elections Assistance Commission is a federal agency that provides guidelines for elections companies to meet. And for those of you that are unfamiliar with the overall process, um, the Elections Assistance Commission only in March of this year uh, updated their rules, which are called 2.0. And so that these rules now that have been crafted, all election companies that want to participate or receive a certification from the United States government must go through this process. The story as it exists today is that the Elections Assistance Commission is now certifying the people outside vendors who will certify companies like us. And there'll be many companies like us that want to come into the business. Um, I'll get into in a minute why I think we're a little bit different, but the answer ultimately will be our experience and our track record. Um, currently, uh, we are engaging software and hardware developers, uh, including Magdil Rodriguez, who I'll speak about in a second. Magdil Rodriguez um, is going to be coming on board to GES, as we've uh, indicated in multiple previous filings, to begin the process of uh, determining the value of our proprietary registration and the value of our proprietary tabulation softwares. Um, GES is currently working with Magdiel Rodriguez to develop a readiness assessment, which is the fourth part. And we, we've talked about this previously. So we're going to keep you posted on that because that's kind of a moving development. And as we finalize some of the deals, these will appear in AKs and in news releases. But most of this has already been previously pre-released. The term sheet we also entered into with a venture called True Vote Inc. Uh, under the terms of this agreement, uh, Global Election Services was investing uh, $50,000 into a 24-month debenture. And we were receiving uh, 3 million common shares of True Vote and Global Arena was providing them uh, with 4,500 warrants at 001. Uh, 
as we said in the proxy, GES is currently negotiating this deal to close this. Um, Catherine will go into a little bit more about TrueVote when she talks about the elections business, but TrueVote just recently published uh, their white paper on elections and blockchain, which we'll post up on our website in the next day. It's available on the TrueVote website, but they have already posted their white paper, and we're very excited uh, to be working with them. Um, the continued development, moving along, um, and the implementation of GS proprietary online election voting system. So many people don't know that we built our own online voting system that is compliant with Title IV of the United States Department of Labor, Office, Labor Management and Standards. GS built the platform, one of the most global infrastructures in the world. We built it on the Amazon Web Services, AWS, which is a comprehensive evolving platform provided by Amazon that includes a mixture of infrastructure, service and platform. Um, important to note that we've previously worked on this uh, uh, software and technology with Oron Technologies uh, located in Texas. Uh, Oron Technologies now is working with GES to currently improve and secure all aspects of our online voting platform and we look further announcements uh, with Oron as uh, some of our package developers for some of our election software so we're very happy to be working with them. I briefly uh, mentioned uh, a minute ago uh, our relationship um, which we describe in our proxy uh, package uh, with HCAS Technologies and its CEO, uh, Magdiel Rodriguez, uh, who is going to be serving uh, in the near term as the Chief Information Officer of uh, Global uh, Election Services. Um, a little bit about Magdiel, and then we hope to introduce you to him in the near future. Um, he has over 25 years' experience in the areas of information security, enterprise risk management and compliance, information technology, and operations. Uh, including 21 years with Visa, uh, where he performed as a senior business leader of information security. Magdiel has expensive experience, extensive experience excuse me, in broad range of areas related to information security, network engineering, enterprise governance, risk and compliance, and payment networks within the financial industry. GHC and GS are currently today working to complete the Master Services Agreement and look forward to separately announcing in detail the terms of the agreements and the employment of Mr. Magdiel Rodriguez. So we're moving forward again on something that we talked about in the proxy. And as, as these materials become definitive, we'll publish them both in an AK and we'll publish them both um, in a public press release. Um, and then lastly, uh, we have a joint venture with Voting Portals. The joint venture makes use of VP online e-voting web portal solutions and priority e-voting software programs. Um, very similar to what we built, although this particular program works very, very well in the area of condo and co-op housing voting. And so we expect to close this deal in the fourth quarter and we look to expand our business, as we previously said, into the housing and condo uh, election business. Um, I think one of the things that's important is that even though we're out uh, conducting elections, uh, you know, weekly now, um, what we really are is a technology company. And I've instructed our attorneys and the people that are involved with our company really to kind of portray that into both our CIK number. We spend most of our time uh, developing technology, whether it be registration software, whether it be tabulation software. Um, for those of you that have been with us a long time, you're aware that we made our first investment in blockchain in 2015. And so our thoughts about blockchain are really broken out into, into two levels. Um, on the first level, blockchain, we believe, will be an unbelievable asset to us in the elections business. We believe its usefulness in the registration of voters is really, uh, there's nothing that can compare to it. Uh, the ability to actually record uh, who is eligible to vote, I think, is at the root of many of the problems that are in the United States election system today. People need to believe that if John Matthews shows up to vote in Nassau County, that John Matthews is actually really John Matthews. We can get into all the perspectives of state laws because states differ by state, which is sometimes good. You know, having a lot of different election laws in America is sometimes very good for America because it makes it so complex to hack. So the fact that we have 50 states doing 50 different things and then inside those states we have counties doing different things is actually a very unique American thing and it's also very good but at the same time the election companies and the election vendors that are supplying these processes to these municipalities must meet the highest levels and the highest standards and must provide uh, the confidence that our citizens demand and actually are entitled to so we have built for paper a registration system and we've built a tabulation system. We have an online voting system that complies with all the rules for the United States Department of Labor. Simultaneously, we're looking to the future. Blockchain, we believe, is going to be an answer for registration. 
I always find it amazing that if you move out of a county, that county can find you if they want to find a tax for you. But if you move out of the county and you want to vote, sometimes the registration doesn't follow from one county to the next. So we believe that a blockchain database um, could be very instrumental in determining who is eligible to vote. And so we have been working in that area and we're going to continue to work in that area. We also believe that blockchain voting for handheld elections, which are approved in some areas, but not in most. Uh, we think that's an integral part of what's coming for the future, and that is the beginning of our joint venture with True Vote. So we think there's a lot to do, and without further ado, because we want to we open this up for some questions today, and I know we're giving a lot of people, particularly new people, a lot of information fast, I want to introduce you to Catherine Weisbeck, who's the president of Global Election Services, Hi. and she'll give you a little bit of background on what Global Election Services does. So Catherine, take it away. Hi, everybody. <clears throat> okay, as John said, I'm Catherine Weisbeck. I am president of Global Election Services. And as he said, Global Election Services, or we call it GES, um, currently accounts for 100% of the, gener the revenue generated for Global Arena Holding. GES cur is currently exploring acquisitions, joint ventures, and building election software and intellectual property for the U.S. and foreign government elections, which GES will own. We also, as John was saying, strongly believe that various blockchain technologies will prove invaluable to the election process in the years to come. GES's senior management has been supervising elections since 1981, having managed approximately 8,600 elections involving over 40 million voters. <laughs> it's a lot. And we certify each labor election with the U.S. Department of Labor. Um, and uh, based on GES's performance, no election has ever been overturned by the Department of Labor. The primary method of voting for GES is paper mail ballots. Um, <clears throat> management has an extremely strong reputation in the market and a very extensive longtime customer list. Most of our customers have been with the management group for decades. Um, GES conducts and administers almost all of its elections, like I said, using paper mail ballots, and all of the results are 100% auditable using a risk-limited audit developed by Professor Philip Stark, Department of Statistics at the University of California, Berkeley. This method guarantees 100% accuracy. Our mission is to help our clients conduct efficient, accurate, secure, and less costly elections with greater participation. As a viable, independent third party managing each election, we work to increase methods of, and rates of participation while maintaining our one voter equals one vote integrity that our management has been committed to for over 40 years. Current proprietary software. We have invested in and developed our proprietary registration software, which we believe is critical to the voting process. Governments and clients alike must accurately determine suitability, eligibility, and ensure the voting public that voter registration rules are beyond repro reproach. GES has developed and deployed proprietary registration software, which was designed specifically to authenticate and register voters. This proprietary software functions as a data and storage retrieval sy registration system by cross-referencing eligibility status within a controlled database. In the mail ballot election, the voter's ID, barcode, QR code, signature on the business reply envelope can be scanned and the status of that voter is identified. If the voter is not eligible to vote or another ballot for that individual has already been registered in the system, alarm bells go off, a big red box pops up on the screen and it lists the reason for the registrar. And that ballot is then marked void or challenged and removed from the count. In an in-person election, the voter provides their name or ID for a voter lookup in the system. If they, can, if they have not yet voted, a signature box pops up on the screen and the voter signs an electronic signature pad where we store, capture that digital signature and store it next to their name. If a voter tries to vote more than once, an alert again will pop up, bells indicating that the, uh, <laughs> the voter has already registered and the voter will not receive an additional ballot. In the instance of a hybrid election, one or more, the, vote, if the voter utilizes multiple methods of voting is what we call a hybrid. Um, if they've mailed in an absentee ballot ahead of time, it's, it flags that and tells us that, you know, they've already voted and we can look up that they've received the mail ballot or that they voted at another polling place. We can see their signature, timestamp, location of where they voted. So it's all uh, checks and balances to make sure they only vote once. The system also has multiple reporting options in order for us to account for every returned ballot. 
The reports include a list of valid envelopes as well as invalid envelopes and why they were void. Once the voter is authenticated, the envelope with all identifiers is removed to ensure the that it's a secret vote and the ballots are prepared for part two, scanning and tabulation. So the second part, we have invested in and developed our own proprietary scanning and tabulation software. Uh, the, the software features advanced OMR, OCR, barcode scanning tabulation system featuring de-skewing, de-speckling, and image correction. The computer hardware was designed to run without internet or Wi-Fi access and is hardwired, ensuring complete security. The system allows for triple auditing capabilities, which are the electronically ge generated tabulation results log, JPEG imaging and storage of each individual ballot, and of course, the physical ballot itself. Once scanned, the software analyzes the voting marks on each ballot. If there are questions, like a section was left blank or they voted for more than one choice, it is flagged for verification. We then check the ballot image to determine the intent of the voter. This advancement gives GES the ability to tabulate elections more faster and with more efficiency. Um, and as John talked about our online voting software, I don't think I need to go over that again, um, but we're really excited about the blockchain. As early as 2014, GES has been an early advocate of blockchain technology. We believe that the blockchain will be a critical component to the voter registration process in the near future. Management sees a unique opportunity in blockchain voting technology and is working with Blockchain Valley Ventures and TrueVote Inc., which could positively impact global in many aspects of its business, including securely storing voter registration information on the blockchain, creating an international capability to administer or joint venture in conducting foreign government elections, creating secure internet voting record on the blockchain for online elections, administer financial services elections, such as proxies and shareholder votes, documenting current voting applications, reducing costs and time of delivery, delivery, enabling scalability. GES has worked with Blockchain Technologies Corp, Blockchain Valley Ventures, and is currently working with TrueVote. In 2019, GES signed an agreement with Blockchain Valley Ventures in Zub, Switzerland, and then uh, we'll, sorry, <laughs> and um, under the terms of the agreement, VVV will serve as an advisor in connection with the voter registration, voter authentication, and voter and eligibility using a blockchain platform covering various matters. As a result of our workings, a working paper was created as a roadmap for discussing a high level in envisioned blockchain platform, including foundation flowchart and implementation recommendations, which are, we're currently developing internally now. Um, GES is also, as John talked about, um, working with TrueVote, um, a comprehensive end-to-end -end decentralized, completely digital voting system. The true vote system is, will be based on traditional proven database methodologies and layered with a checksum that is posted on the blockchain, providing all data is mutable and unalterable. The design will ensure that every vote is transparently counted and verifiable. TrueVote is directed by Brett Morrison, formerly the Director of Enterprise Information Systems at SpaceX, and Ped Hasid, who graduated UCLA with magna cum laude honors in 2007. Ped later went on to co-found Block 26, a venture vehicle for the DLT space established in 2014. As John previously stated, GES is currently renegotiating this contract. TrueVote published their white paper in June, as he said, on voting using Bitcoin blockchain. GES is currently in discussions with TrueVote True to close this deal in the fourth quarter. Um, we, are, we can take questions right now. We're happy to um, open that up. But I did want to say um, definitely check out the, the share, all of our um, filings on sec.gov, as well as you can email us at Catherine at vote GE, or Catherine at global election services.com. Sorry, I wrote global arena holdings. uh, arena uh It's on our website. <laughs> Sorry. Um, and then we have phone numbers. 646-801-5524 or 646-801-6146, public company numbers. And we are opening it up to questions. Have it. Great job. Okay. We do have lots of questions for you all. Okay. I'm just going to start at the top. So uh, Robert Rayer says, uh, I noticed a significant increase in elections income. Would you comment on that? And um, 
Mr. Matthews, he's asking, in reviewing the company's questions over the past year, I noticed a significant reduction in debt. Please explain. Uh, so, uh, one, yes, the uh, the elections business has uh, started to grow as we felt more comfortable with uh doing elections, we started to do bigger and bigger elections. So we went from little local elections of maybe 1,500 to 3,000 people to international elections that might encompass 40 to 60,000 people. We've started to travel all over the country and we've expanded the business through the use of the internet voting, which uh, can handle a lot of associations. So the business has grown because we're very comfortable in the software. We're able to bid on more uh, more jobs and we've been fortunate to win some big jobs uh in relation to the second part of the question yes management is extremely uh aggressive right now in renegotiating early debt that we needed to sell uh, years ago um to survive frankly you know four or five years ago and so i think uh everyone probably for those new shareholders that don't know we were able to renegotiate toxic debt uh, actually uh remove it from our balance sheet. And I think that that was the first result that Mr. Ryers is uh, talking about in the second quarter. We were able to refinance a significant amount of debt um, that was uh, favorable, we believe, to the company, which is being reflected on our balance sheets. We're going to continue to renegotiate debt. And currently, uh, we have little to the minimum, no toxic debt. Um, Whereas that would be a statement, uh, and I would certainly look at the SEC filings just to see that, you know, in person, you'll see that a lot in the derivative liability. But thank you for the question. Robert also has a follow-up question wanting you to explain the difference in derivative income from this quarter from last. So derivative income uh, turns out to be the amount of money that if we have a debenture or a note that we sell and a person has the right to convert that note, if the convertible note um, is at a cheaper price, let's say you were to convert someone at five cents a share and the stock was 10 cents a share, that five cents would be a paper loss, but it's still a hit to financials. In other words, if a person converted stock at five cents and the stock was 10 cents, um, the company would no longer have the debt, but the company would have to report as a loss the difference between five and 10. So derivative liability tends to move up and down depending on the share price. Uh, uh, Connor Hoffman, yeah, are you finished? Sorry, we got I'm cut sorry, off. Said. Okay. Um, Connor Hoffman wants to know, how have you grown? And can you elaborate as to how you've gotten to where you are now and how you will multiply in the future? It's a good question. Um, so I, I think how we've grown is we, we've spent a lot of money and a lot of uh, time and a lot of advice um, really developing a technology. I mean, as I said earlier in my comments, we're a technology company. Um, one of the things I think that, you know, people are really unfamiliar with is the amount of work and technology that went into develop these software systems. I mean, uh, even though they're labor unions, you know, we're dealing with the U.S. Uh, Department of Labor and the U.S. Department of Labor often hires the United States Attorney's Office to investigate claims. So we're very serious about what we build when we go out to do an election. So to be real, to be real clear about it, uh, most of this would be pointed out in our growth. You know, we grew from small unions uh, to little, you know, to to, to larger internationals uh, to the extent last year where we took the great leap, thanks to Catherine and her team, to go run the North Dakota presidential uh, primary for the North Dakota NDPL Democrats. As most people know, there were no Republican primaries, but the Democrats. Democrats had primaries. So we ran the statewide election, um, which was as good a test for any to give us the confidence to move forward. And we successfully ran that election. And many newspapers said it was the fastest caucus in the United States last year. So we're very proud of that as well. Nate Finley wants to know uh, about the North Dakota Democratic, the NDL presidential primary election. What was that like? It was a little overwhelming. I can have Catherine answer real briefly because she was the one tasked with staffing it, moving the equipment, putting people in position. But it was a statewide election. So why don't you fill them in? Yeah. Well, so uh, we had 14 uh, polling locations that we had to staff and, and um, put, uh, set up equipment in across the state. So that in and of itself, just logistically, was an incredible task and, and having supervisors and all the computers and, and everything set up. Um, but prior to the election, there was actually a, an absentee ballot option. So we staffed a call center where um, the interesting thing about North Dakota is everybody can vote. Like there's no primary party registration. So our list was the phone book. So it was 600,000 plus names. And any anybody could call up as long as they were, of course, of voting age and lived in the state. And they could request an absentee ballot. Then that goes back to our registration systems, because on the day, we had to know if someone tried to, if they came in to vote in person, 
did they send in a ballot? And um, actually, at my location, nobody tried, which was good. Um, but if they had, you know, that it would have flagged it and we would have not given them, obviously, an in-person ballot. Additionally, we had um, over 100 volunteers at each location mixing in throughout the day that would come and be registrars. So we had to be able to train them in a short amount of time. As you've maybe seen at polling places, a lot of times they're um, retired individuals that may not be as savvy on computers. So they all took to it um, very easily. And it was we were really happy to see how intuitive the software really was. And it was successful and wonderful. Yeah, we did great. Yeah, I think the thing that it surprised me the most, not surprised me, I, you know, whenever you go into these things, you want to be honest with people. And I was terrified, you know, because... <laughs> We were covering a whole state. We had 600,000 names. If you, as Catherine alluded to, if you if you voted by mail, we had to put you on a non-vote list again. So that had to close. Then we had to open up in person. We had to open up in person sites, and then our registration software had to be pliable enough so that average people who don't have a lot of experience, right, who just volunteer, you know, can show up at nine o'clock in the morning and 15 minutes later could be registering voters. So for us, it really was the definitive proof that our registration systems could be used by anyone. Uh, that they're very easy to use and that we could register and vote people in person. And that's a hybrid because they also voted by mail. And then simultaneously, we were able to scan all the ballots and get out one of the quickest results in the U.S. caucus history last year. We, so, had, we had three scanning locations. So there were three right. main headquarters that all the ballots would go to their region. Right. And um, and it was, you know, we just like like John said, it was we were very proud that it was um, as as a. Uh, I don't know, flawless as it was. Right. And then we came back to uh, New York uh, the next day and we hit the pandemic like everyone else and we lost an entire calendar year. So that's what happened in 2020. For yeah, that was else. March 10th, 2020. Oh. Wow. <laughs> there, yeah. were, there weren't a lot of people yeah. getting together after March 20th. So that's one of, you know, that's just another thing we all inherited as everybody. Right. Exactly. Thank you for that. Uh, Derek Rivas wants to know what's the government opportunity for this? Well, the Brennan Center says it's a $2 billion opportunity over the next five years. Uh, the Brennan Center is an independent uh, think tank. Um, you know, municipal counties, uh, it's a very good question. Municipal counties, I think a lot of people, when they think elections, they think president, Congress, or senators, you know, every four years, every two years for Congress, every six years, senator. But all municipal board of elections, I learned from my dad, are running elections in a county 11, 14 times a month, I mean a year. You know, you'll have, uh, you'll have assemblymen running, your state senators are gonna run, your aldermen are gonna run, you know, your mayors are gonna run, your judges are gonna run, school, board. uh, school boards are gonna run. I mean, the list that these counties have to deal with on an annual basis. And so counties consistently upgrade, I know this from my family, uh, consistently upgrade their software and their hardware. You know, it's very important to understand that in this decision-making process at the county level, most times, generally, there's a committee made up of Democrats and Republicans, or it's a Democratic and Republican commissioner. So this is a very, very uh, bipartisan decision that's made at the county level because they're spending tax dollars to buy this information. Now, the tax dollars is supplied um, by the federal government many times. And what we'll put up on our site in the next week or so will be some of the various uh, ways that municipalities finance themselves, which comes directly, by the way, from our tax dollars. So in effect, our own tax dollars are being being deployed, just like they're deployed everywhere else, into these counties to buy correct election equipment and software. And so the money is going to be made available. One of the other things that gives us an advantage in this um, space, because of course it's such a hot topic, buzz thing, elections, as John alluded to earlier, many companies are flooding in saying, oh, we can do this better. We got this. We're technology. But one of the advantages we really have is this track record with the um, 40, 40 plus years with our management team. So we really know the ins and outs. But we also have that with the Department of Labor and that that um, that long track record, which gives those decision makers confidence in choosing our company. Right. So I think we just want to be specific, because when we say the track record. The track record is really Marilyn and my dad and, and, and the experience. Um, you know, Global Election Services, we went into this business in 2015. But people do know us. People know these people and they're with us. And we're going to continue to expand our company. And, you know, as, as we alluded to in the past, we're going to continue to grow the company. Camden Romero wants to know why he doesn't see any of your news on the otcmarkets.com. Um, we've actually published it there. Uh, I can go check for you. I just updated, uh, OTC markets has been, and they've been great to us actually, but OTC markets has been a little overwhelmed. They had a rule change in September that many of you might be aware of, and they've been kind of overwhelmed. But, uh, when I, 
I'll, I'll double check the links. I just recently, uh, when I saw, I had people contact me. I just changed the description. I just changed a bunch of information in the factual area, and I did see us posted. So I'll go back and check for you. Okay. Uh, Emily Moyer wants to know if you have any patents on this technology. Uh, no, we don't have any patents yet. And one of the reasons is a lot of the technology as it, as it, as it relates to uh, elections, um, some of our, some portions of what we have developed can be patented, but some portions can't be. And then that deals mostly with imaging. So when we talk about imaging, a lot of imaging uh, patents have already been created by Eastman Kodak and Xerox way back when. And so there are various services that we subscribe to. Um, Abby is one of them. But uh, these are services that provide imaging services for us. So you really can't patent on top of a patent. What we'll be looking to do, and, and again, I'll have to address this you know, in an AK. It's a very good question. Um, it, it's something that people in, in, in instances like this, some people patent a process. Right. So what we're looking to do is put all the pieces together. And that's something that, you know, we might consider if 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 you think it's if we if if our board and everyone thinks it's valuable. Harv Rivas wants to know if you have any plans for a reverse split. N not currently, Harv Rivas. And thank you for asking that question. Um, you know, in 2019, I had the right to do a one for reverse split. And I think for 365 days, someone asked me every day, am I going to do the reverse split? Um, we brought the reverse split into play for the board of directors so that to be practical, the elections company has a valuation of what today's market price is, which I think is like 5.2 when we started the meeting. Um, and so we feel that that's a tremendous uh, disadvantage uh, to the elections company. Um, there are private elections companies similar to us trading at significantly higher multiples in the private market because they don't have the liability of the public market. And we feel that if someone were to come or if there was a business or an opportunity where we thought it was accretive or something that was really beneficial to all, you know, shareholders, everybody, then we would fully vet that idea with our outside public accountants, our inside accountants and staff and the boards and, uh, you know, obviously our debt people and, and see if it was something that was really beneficial to everyone. But at this point in time, no, we do not have any plan to do a one for 12 reverse. I will caution you and say that if someone were to call me tomorrow and say, hey, we want to do something, yeah, we'd file an AK, and we, but we'd make sure it was really worthwhile because we get diluted too. I mean, you know, there's no side deals here anywhere, you know. Got it. This is probably the last question from Reese Herman. How do you plan on capturing market share and differentiating yourself from the competitors? It's a very good question. So we've begun to uh, market our technology. Uh, we've begun to actually market. Um, we did our first mailing to uh, uh, an international organization. We mailed about 800 locals. Uh, we're going to be doing more marketing uh, in global election services, and we're going to begin to highlight, um, you know, our track record and our relationships. Uh, also, if anyone is uh, watching, we just recently uh, started Twitter. A number of shareholders have been asking me about our social media campaign. So I think we did our, uh, we're up to two tweets. Uh, I'm getting, I'm not, I'm not there yet, but uh, we just want to make sure we comply with all the rules and regulations. So yeah, but we started, uh, we're, we're, we're starting to expand our social media presence and we're going to begin a lot more marketing. Well, that, that leads into one last quick question from Larry Mont. Can you go into some more details about your social media campaign? Is it to gain shareholders, gain business? What's your current budget? And what do you expect the return to be? Uh, very good questions. So, so the social Agreed. media... <laughs> yeah, the, the social media campaign is designed to get the message out. Um, there's a lot of people that don't read press releases. There's a lot of people that don't read financials. There's a lot of people that don't go to the SEC links. We didn't uh, even do press releases for the longest time. I think we've done more press releases in the last quarter than we ever did. This is our second webinar in two months. I think we need to get our message out. We need to speak to uh, shareholders, we need to let them know what's going on. And, and we also know that clients are looking at this. And so these are the kind of uh, things that we're going to expand. As far as a budget, you know, we don't have a fixed budget. Um, we're very happy with Twitter. Uh, we're, we're toying with Facebook. We looked at it. We had a Facebook page. We had two million uh, likes from people that wanted us to go to the Bahamas with them. It was, it looked, you know, I, I, you know, we're busy working. So, but we're going to begin to use social media to point to all of our announcements, to point to all of our case and to put all SEC filings. Um, when we think we're going to have an announcement now, we're going to put it out on social media as well as the uh, normal routes of media that we use. Great. Well, we do have quite a few questions left for you, but we are out of time now. So we certainly hope you come back on again and give us some more updates. 
Thank you. And for anybody whose questions we didn't ask answer, please feel free to contact us, uh, and we'll try to answer. You know, uh, you know, go to our website. Uh, we're happy to answer questions, and we'll get back to anybody that reaches out to us. Thank you, everybody, for their time today. Thank you very much for hosting us at your seminar and at your webinar. This is just fantastic. Good. And everybody, we're so glad. Safe. Thank yes, you. Yes, we're so glad we could. Thank you both. Thanks again. All right, everyone, stay with Thanks us now. as we transition to the next presenter. We'll be right back. Okay. Bye bye.